Hi everybody, I'm going to talk a little bit about sovereignty uh, representative models for Indigenous people in Australia, namely ATSIC, and the models of representation currently in use by the Indigenous Sami people of Northern Scandinavia, and I'm also going to talk about governance. So I'll begin by talking about sovereignty. A loose definition of sovereignty is to have authority over a particular territory. There are different levels of sovereignty. There can be total sovereignty, where people have total authority. And there can be restricted sovereignty, where people may not necessarily have total authority but may negotiate some form of authority. Terms such as sovereignty have been used in Indigenous struggles for land rights. However, the term has a different meaning to different people. For example, Indigenous people may use the term to argue for full authority whereas governments may take a different view. This different perspective was how the Aboriginal Tent Embassy in Canberra came about. The government at the time took the position that Aboriginal people could use their traditional lands if they could demonstrate that they had a viable plan for things such as economic development and that in these plans Aboriginal people could show that they could lease the land from the government. In the Madden reading she refers to the term unfinished business. This is a term that Indigenous people often use when they are campaigning for rights. The term implies that they have never actually surrendered their lands to the colonisers. So take a couple of minutes after this re recording to have a look at the Thorpe website on LearnLine. Now what Indigenous people in Australia are saying is that there have never actually been any written documents or agreements between Indigenous people in Australia and the colonisers. In Australia, Indigenous people were denied any possibility of sovereignty on the grounds that they were subhuman, that they did not really exist or matter. The land was terra nullius and the Indigenous people were just nomads. The governments of colonised countries around the world have been reluctant to address the issue of sovereignty and instead have preferred to talk about and I emphasize talk about things such as health, education and employment. The thing to remember is that these are all government responsibilities anyway so they should be delivering these services regardless not just talking about them. The fact that governments have failed in these areas is enough for Indigenous people to argue for at least some level of sovereignty. Another valid reason for Indigenous people wanting some level of sovereignty is that one of the United Nations Charter Articles stipulates that all countries that are members of the United Nations, as is Australia, should refrain from using force to challenge another country's territory or political independence. According to the Cornell reading, tribal sovereignty is fundamental to Indigenous people successfully managing their own affairs. It is fundamental to the well-being 
of the economic and well-being of indigenous people. However, the issue of sovereignty is not a straightforward one. There are many simple issues that need to be addressed and really will probably not be able to be addressed. One of these significant issues is the issue of representation. Will all Indigenous people be subject to Indigenous law, for example, and who decides this? Do Indigenous people want to be told by other Indigenous people what laws they live under? For more about Indigenous law and Western law, please make sure that you have a look at the Sutton reading and do the required activity. So the issue there is, well, who determines things on behalf of Indigenous people? And what gives them the right to? And do other Indigenous people have to go along with that? Okay, so this is the issue of representation. And now I want to talk about the models of representation that have been used in Indigenous affairs in Australia and Norway, Finland and Sweden. Okay? Um, because that's where the Sami people's traditional lands are. And the Sami people, as we know from the readings, are in a bit of a unique situation because their land was actually colonised by four different countries. So, for example, if you get your finger and slice that uh, into four different pieces, that's exactly what's happened to the Sami lands. Um, Norway, Sweden, Finland and Russia um, all are claimed certain areas of their traditional lands. So I just spoke about sovereignty and explained what it is and I also explained that it is not a straightforward notion. I went on to explain that one of the reasons for this is the issue of representation. I want to spend a few minutes now talking a little bit about attempts that have been made to overcome this issue of representation for Indigenous people. One will be from Australia, as I said, and one will be from the Sami of Northern Scandinavia. Now, I will begin by talking about Australia. In Australia, one attempt to provide Indigenous people with national representation was the former Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission, often known as ATSIC. Now, ATSIC was created to provide Indigenous people with more participation in the formulation and implementation of government programs. This was done by a Western voting system where Indigenous people would nominate themselves for a particular constituency and people would turn up to vote on voting day. Basically, there were 35 regional council elections that were held every four years. These elected members would then elect a chair and deputy chair. The 35 regions were divided into 12 zones. Each of these zones then elected a commissioner and deputy commissioner to the National Board to represent them. The National Board then elect a National ATSIC Commissioner and a Deputy Commissioner. It is this individual, the ATSIC Commissioner, and his deputy or her deputy, who supposedly represent all Indigenous Australians and could influence the agenda for governments and Indigenous people. Now, ATSIC was abolished in 1994 by the Howard government on the grounds that it had failed Indigenous people in terms of education, health and housing, for example. The Howard government's approach to ATSIC at the time was helped by negative views towards ATSIC by Indigenous people. 
They would constantly see images of indigenous people in government jobs, flying around the country, going to conferences, meeting with government ministers. However, at the same time, indigenous people were not seeing any positive outcomes in their communities. On a daily basis, they were directly exposed to the images of a society entrenched in government neglect. Because of this, they became disenfranchised with ATSIC and many, many wanted ATSIC gone. However, what many Indigenous people were not clear about was that ATSIC did not have any power. ATSIC was not responsible for service delivery of any kind. ATSIC was a Commonwealth Government Agency. Education, Health and Housing are the responsibility of State and Territory Governments. ATSIC did not have a budget to deliver services. Most of its budget was spent on the Community Development Employment Project. For those of you who are not aware of this project, it is often referred to as CDEP. It is a program that began in the 1970s where Indigenous people would perform tasks in communities such as rubbish removal, grounds maintenance and gardening duties and would be paid unemployment benefits as a wage. Now this is something that many people are not aware of and we see this with terms such as sit-down money. For too long, Indigenous people on unemployment benefits have been described as getting sit-down money and non-Indigenous people have not been described in this way. The fact of the matter is, Indigenous people around the world have always worked and they have always been a means of labour exploitation and we see this in the cattle industry where indigenous people were the backbone of the cattle industry in Australia however they did not get paid so if we were to watch a video of the White House in America from 150 years ago or 100 years ago we may see that the people doing all of the cleaning the cooking looking after the kids the gardening are all African-American people. The same in Australia, however, they did not get paid. Okay, And what CDP also did was denied Indigenous people award wages because if you were on CDP, you would get unemployment benefits. If you were working in town, you would get the award rate, you would get superannuation, uh, leave loading, holidays, etc. Now, since ATSIC was abolished in 1994, there has been one attempt made by the Australian Government to provide a national voice for Indigenous people and to represent Indigenous people directly with the Australian Government. This was the Howard Government's appointed National Indigenous Advisory Council. This advisory council was of course criticised by Indigenous people on the grounds of representation. One of the things that governments do with Indigenous issues is capitalise on this issue of representation. For example, a government may have an Indigenous Advisory Council on, say, housing, for example, Indigenous housing. Often, the people the government appoint to these councils are people who have no experience in housing or have no qualifications, have trouble understanding and reading English, etc. Or, these individuals are what's known as yes people. These people have displayed a similar political alliance or shared ideology of the government of the day 
and therefore these people do not make waves. So these are people that governments can trust to sit down and go along with them. And of course, these advisory councils should be totally independent of government. For example, you can have a um, an Indigenous Health Advisory Council and although there may be Indigenous doctors out there, none of them ha would have been invited to sit on this Indigenous Advisory Health Council. So this is just an example, okay? Now, often Indigenous people who are employed in the public sector cannot say negative things about the government of the day anyway. It is part of public sector code of conduct. And because of this, these Indigenous advisory councils, as I said, should be totally independent of government. It really does not matter what model of representation governments come up with, the government will still be controlling the Indigenous agenda. In Australia, Indigenous people are continuing to struggle to find a national voice for themselves. In other countries, however, such as the United States, which we will discuss, um, or we have discussed now in week four, um, and Norway, Sweden, and Finland. In these countries, indigenous people have a national voice that talks directly to governments. The Sami have a parliamentary system that is similar to the ATSIC model. The Norwegian Sami parliament was established in 1989 as a means for the Sami people in Norway to elect their own people to deal with their own issues. And they also have elections every four years. Now, like ATSIC, the Sami parliament receives its funding from the national government. The main purpose of the Norwegian Sami parliament is to provide advice on Sami issues to the Norwegian government. In Finland, the Sami parliament was opened in 1996. It consists of 21 representatives from the municipalities in the Sami Demissible area. In Sweden, the Sami parliamentary system is similar. Russia is the only one of the four countries that colonized the traditional lands of the Sami people that does not have a Sami parliament. However, at the moment, the Russian government are looking into it. Similarly to ATSIC, each Sami parliament elect a president. These presidents then have dialogue with governments of the day in each respective country, Norway, Sweden and Finland. So people, as I said, put their hand up, they nominate themselves to run for a particular area. People turn up to vote for them. All of the people who have voted in successfully on election day get together and vote for one or two others, a deputy and a chair from that region. And then all of those regions get together and they vote for a national chair and a national deputy chair who has direct dialogue with government. Okay, So it's what those individuals raise with governments that are typically on the indigenous government agenda. Now I want to talk a bit about governance. I have just talked briefly about sovereignty and the issues involved with sovereignty through the discussion on ATSIC and the parliamentary systems um, of the Sami in Norway, Sweden and Finland. And we have seen how issues such as sovereignty are placed on the national agenda through these processes. Now I want to spend a few minutes talking about governance. Some of you may be familiar with the term and some of you may not. 
Please note that the term governance is different to the term government. As I said last week, if Indigenous people want to be in control of their own affairs, they must practice good governance. This governance is a Western system of governance that is all too often completely foreign to Indigenous people. It is important to point out that there are no indigenous organizations or corporations in Australia that exist independently of Western governance procedures. And I'll talk a little bit more about this a bit later. Good governance is crucial to indigenous autonomy. In Australia, indigenous organisations and corporations are typically not-for-profit organisations and because of this, their governance models are typically like this. They have a list of members and they have their own rules about how these members can become members and how these members then elect a governing committee. Or a board of directors. This board of directors then hire, fire and manage the chief executive officer. The chief executive officer manages the organization and its staff. So the structure is members slash board slash members then CEO, then staff. So I'm going to end this recording. Okay, so look out for part two.